So I think my background and origin story has a lot to do with the way I look at the world today. Do you want to hear a fun story? Of course I want to hear a fun story. <laughs> today we have a very special guest, Ileana Oris Valiente. She's a corporate executive who's focused on emerging societal and technological trends. She's a startup investor, board member, published author, public speaker, and community builder. What's your secret? The more you lean into who you are and what your strengths are, the more likely you are to find yourself in a position where roles are being made for you yeah. and you can kind of carve out your own career pathway. And that's generally what happened to, to me. And I remember in early days hanging out in dark, dingy basements with some of the smartest blockchain people that are still around today and that were behind some of the earliest products and protocols. And I realized these people are brilliant and they're doing some really cool work, but no one understands anything that they're doing. People are not really welcoming to change. People like, hate change. Especially in these like age old industries where things have been working really well for a long time. Correct. It's not just the big companies though. Humans in general don't love change. It takes a lot of mental processing and cognitive power, and if it ain't broken, don't fix it, is the prevailing sentiment. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me today. I just want to start jumping into your career and mm -hmm. just talk about getting such a big role so early. So <laughs> if you could just walk me through the early beginnings of your life and just tell me a little bit more about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how much time do we have here. I've had a very non-traditional background, both mm -hmm. in terms of life experience as well as work experience. And I think the moral of the story is the more you lean into who you are and what your strengths are, the more likely you are to find yourself in a position where roles are being made for you yeah. and you can kind of carve out your own career pathway. And that's generally what happened to, to me. But the long story short, I actually started my career wanting to work for the United Nations and save the world and initially started my academic studies in an international development type of program. I wanted to work for the UN. That was the goal. And mm -hmm. I remember sitting and talking to a prof of mine about what career pathways would, would entail. And after he walked me through all of the schooling I would need to do and how then I would be a junior attache on some file, not really able to make a systems level impact in the world, yeah. I realized, oof, maybe I need to make a make a pivot. So I ended up pursuing the chartered accountancy designation. I've worked in tax, I've worked in audit, I worked on the corporate finance, business valuations side of things. I got interested and involved in the blockchain space and said, oh, well, these are just ledgers and they're distributed. I come from an accounting and auditing background I'm pretty sure this is going to change the way finance works and the way that accounting happens. And I pitched the idea to some very senior execs, including the global head of audit at one of the world's biggest um, audit, audit firms. And you could see the blood draining from his face. And he said, huh, if you're right, this is going to be a really big deal for our business. Here's some money. Go away. Think about this some more. Come back to me with a point of view and a perspective on what this might mean for the future of our business. So long story short, I built a consulting practice at Deloitte focused on blockchain. And that was the first ever blockchain consulting business anywhere in the world at a large scale focused on large corporations. Did that for a bit, left, did my own nonprofit for a bit. And then I joined Accenture as the global blockchain innovation lead. Mm -hmm. And after about a year and a half of that, I got tapped on the shoulder because our North American CEO, Julie Sweet, who is now the Accenture global CEO, yeah. wanted to build a series of innovation hubs in North America, and Canada was one location. And so I was tapped on the shoulder to see whether I would potentially build that out. And I got a chance to start from zero and essentially some instructions on the back of a napkin and build an entire team and function in my own liking, which has been a really incredible journey. So yeah. that's the... <laughs> career, random career arc that doesn't really make sense. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it follows I, that transition from wanting to do the UN into going into corporate where you think you'd have more of an impact. Mm -hmm. I want to dive into like each of those different points a little bit more. Yeah. I kind of just want to start like really early on. Like, sure. Where did you grow up? <laughs> like, how was life like in high school? And then 
before you got your CPA designations and then made that pivot to start your career? (laughs) So I think my background and origin story has a lot to do with the way I look at the world today. I am by ethnic origin, half Cuban and half Russian. Mm. And so I spent my childhood growing up in Siberia and in Cuba. So talk about two very (laughs) different... That's a big contrast. (laughs) Two very, very, very different environments, different culture, different temperature, different language. Mm -hmm. And then when my family and I had moved to Canada, we had bounced around. We spent some time living outside Mm -hmm. of Toronto. I went to school in Ottawa. I lived in Vancouver. I had spent some time living in, in Copenhagen and through work and through my personal travels, I've been pretty fortunate to go a little bit here, there, and and everywhere. So that's, I think, the geographic arc of my of my story. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's a lot of different places in a very short span of time. Even within yeah. Canada, you were moving around a lot. Yeah. And why were you guys moving around? Like, did, did your parents have to travel for work, or was it just... So in a way, we have a very classic Canadian immigrant story. Both mm-hmm. of my parents are engineers by training. That's how they ended up uh, meeting in Russia while they were in, in school. But when we emigrated to Canada, it was a lot easier to come here as landed immigrants than it was, for example, to go to, to the U.S. And when we got here, it was the classic story of we had zero money. My parents actually had to borrow money from friends that had moved to a different country. Um, so they had enough to prove that they could legally come here mm-hmm. and then eventually pay pay that back. And when we arrived, I remember my dad was delivering pizzas and my mother was cleaning office buildings, mm-hmm. even though they're both engineers, but you know, they had to yeah. relearn, retrain, recertify. Like their degrees. All recognized. the degrees, exactly. Yeah. And so we moved partly as a result of that throughout Ontario. And then when it came time for university, I went to Ottawa, partly because it was the bilingual French and English bit, and wanting to pursue a career that was more development focused and Mm -hmm. global in nature, I figured being in the nation's capital would be a good life. It's a good good track to the UN goal. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. So then from there, you, what did you study in university while pursuing, were you, like, when did you make that transition of like, I no longer want to pursue this UN because I don't think it's going to lead to what I want in terms of making a global impact? to Mm -hmm. actually going down the road, which you did. Mm -hmm. So I was about a year and a half into my program when I'm really glad I sat down to have those very candid conversations with my, with my prof and realized I need to make a pivot. I was paying my own way through school and the prospect of having to do a master's degree and then a PhD and then to start uh, a very entry level career. I'm like, I don't have the financial resources (laughs) to be able to Mm -hmm. bootstrap my way through all of this. I need to find a career that's more financially sustainable for for myself because financial independence is important. And I looked around at the courses I had taken and all the friends that I had met and I realized most of my friends that I was really close to were actually in commerce. Mm. And there were a few overlapping courses around economics and stats that were required whether you were a business person or you were studying this development program. And I loved all of those courses. Plus I kind of missed math. (laughs) <laughs> which I didn't think was going to be the yeah. the case, but it was. So I ended up switching into an international business program, thinking, oh, this is a good way of combining global plus commerce. And then eventually, at one point in my career, I'll be able to build enough of a platform to do more of the social impact side of, of things. And after some time, I was out in an event and I met this woman, Katie, and we're chatting and she looks at me and she says, have you ever considered a career as a CPA, as a chartered accountant. It was a CA at, th- at the time. And I said, no, I, I haven't. In fact, I don't even know what a CA is. I probably am embarrassed to admit that today because I was partway through my university studies. Yeah. And she says, well, I work at a company called Deloitte and we have offices in 140 countries around the world and I could absolutely see you doing really well there. And so she encouraged me to do some research and to apply. And I did, but I wasn't even an accounting student. I was doing this international business program. So I ended up switching again and graduating with a finance background with an accounting specialization in the commerce uh, program. And funny enough, today, I happened to sit on the board of directors of CPA Ontario. 
which is the entity <laughs> representing 100,000 CPAs in yeah. the province. Yeah, that's, congrats on that from not even knowing what CPA or CAA at the time was. Exactly. It's funny how, how life works. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. So then you took that lady's advice and went down that path. and I went down that room. path and started working in uh, global tax, actually. Mm. I was doing cross-border tax for high net worth individuals, including sports teams. I don't mm. know anything about sports, so please don't ask me any follow-up <laughs> questions on that. But <laughs> it was interesting I to won't. see, like, oh, can I Google this person? Oh, okay, got it. This is what sport they're part of, that team. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> that must be a really cool job, just like auditing, getting to see the financial records behind the scenes of like mm-hmm. these very prestigious, well-known companies. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, that's part of the reason I ended up moving from tax to audit, because in audit, it's one of the very few occupations you have where early on in your career, you get an overall understanding of the financials of a business mm. and you get an understanding of what drives that business. Yeah. What are the most important decisions that they need to make? What are the key risks that are keeping the CFOs and the executives up at night? I remember loving walking into my client offices. And after I asked all of my perfunctory questions that were off of my checklist, yeah. I got to say, so what keeps you up at night? What else are you thinking about? <laughs> what are you not thinking about? And you could see the people on the other side of the table. And like, oh, OK, right. I guess I should answer this, this question. And I got this crash course of an education into the minds of senior execs across a number of industries. Do you want to hear a fun story? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> of course I want to hear a fun story. <laughs> so one of my projects was auditing a satellite company. So mm. up above in the air satellites. Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating assignment. And my immediate assignment right after that was auditing dot 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 a cemetery. So from up above in outer space to way down below. And I had to be on site at the cemetery every day. And I remember I'd have my tea in the morning, looking out the window, looking at the tombstones, thinking, wow, what a diverse set of experiences I'm currently getting. (laughs) But you can bet I left that office every day at 4.30 on the button because at 5 p.m. they close the gates to the cemetery. And the last thing you want to do is get stuck there overnight. Absolutely not. But I learned... (laughs) A lot. And I got my whole taste tester menu of different industries, getting a sense of, oh, would I ever want to do work in the forestry domain or auditing like physical security like guard companies or mm. the satellites or the funerals or hospitals or other financial services companies. And I'm like, oh, this is another crash course education, mini MPA. Yeah. No, that's so cool because yeah. you get to like see under the hood of like, I'd imagine at Deloitte you're dealing with some big accounts, some pretty mm-hmm. prestigious mm-hmm. high up companies where that are doing something right to be there to have Deloitte take them on as a client. Yeah, it's so part of the big four. There are four big yeah. audit and accounting firms in the world that collectively audit pretty much every of the Fortune 500 organizations out there mm. that needs that established credibility and the stamp, if you yeah. if you will. From that crash course and getting to see all these industries, you got to learn probably so much Mm -hmm. from like (laughs) way up above to down below to everything in between, like learning about these businesses. I'm I'm actually kind of envious because I'd love to just see the financial statements of so many businesses. I'll be like, I wonder how much you're actually making. Where does this expense go? Mm -hmm. I am envious. You got to see it with some of the top players, you know, probably in various industries, you're like, I know exactly what goes on <laughs> behind the scenes with them. Mm-hmm. So from there, learning a lot about different companies and doing accountant, you stumbled upon blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? So there was an in-between, there was an in-between step, okay. which was the challenge I was experiencing with audit was after this crash course, I realized audit by its nature looks backwards. What happened in the past year Mm. to an organization as opposed to what is going to happen in the future and I have been to have more of a future orientation so I thought about where was my CPA useful where did it have transferable skills that would still be client facing and before I went down the CPA route and just fully committed committed I'd done a couple of um, co-ops and internship placements I had an offer to join an investment bank 
And when the person interviewing me found out that I had a returning offer to go and finish my CPA designation, he looked at me and said, I really want to hire you. But if you have the option to do your CPA, go do that. And then after you qualify and you get your designation, then I will gladly hire you. Because when I look around at our executive table at such and such big name bank, he says a disproportionate number of the executives that we have are actually CAs by training. Mm. And so that was part of my inspiration for sticking out that process. And I'm really glad I did because it was just such a helpful way of thinking about the world and, and business. So I transitioned out of the world of tax and audit and into the corporate finance arm and division and specifically using my skills to do business valuations. So before a company gets sold, somebody needs to figure out what's the value of this company? Mm -hmm. What is the price tag that you put on it? And that's what I was working on. And once again, I got a chance to work across a number of industries and I realized my favorite industry to work with was tech. And it was fast paced, it was moving quickly and I found myself really engaged in the tech ecosystem. I would go to the various meetups, I would meet the lawyers, other investment bankers, and one thing led to another and I was suddenly bringing in deal flow and turning into more of a business development person, not yeah. a skill set I <laughs> thought I, I had, but whoops, accidentally started to to do that. And as I continued to grow and grow my, my network, I was finding myself spending a lot of time with people working in the early blockchain crypto days. And I had first found out about crypto a couple of years prior through a friend of mine who had said... Ileana, you travel a lot and you are always complaining about foreign currencies that you end up bringing home from your travels that literally sit in a Ziploc container. I have an entire drawer of Ziploc bags of different country currencies. It's like, oh, Swiss francs. <laughs> the next time I go to Switzerland, I will remember to bring this. The next time you go to Switzerland, you, <laughs> you never do because you're accidentally rerouted and you're already in London and you just go straight to Switzerland. Yeah. And I'm like, whoops, sorry, taking currency out of circulation. Please don't report me. <laughs> 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 and to me, the idea of global borderless money made a whole lot of sense, yeah. especially the idea that you would have money for the Internet because the Internet didn't have a native payments layer baked into it mm -hmm. and so it really really resonated and I remember in early days hanging out in dark dingy basements there's a story on on that that I can go into if you want later but dark dingy basements with some of the smartest blockchain people that are still around today and that were behind some of the earliest products and protocols including Vitalik, Buter um, Vitalik Buterin and I realized these people are brilliant and they're doing some really cool work but no one understands anything that they're doing. The, the average layperson, yeah. even the, to this day, even, there's even, a lot of even to this just, day, because it's so technical and it's so jargon heavy. And the people that are drawn to that field for the most part, don't come from a storytelling or communications oh. or marketing backgrounds. And so I spent a lot of time sitting with them. It took a while for them to warm up to me. And they were yeah. like, who, <laughs> Who are you? Um, actually, I'll tell you the story. Of yeah, I want. I really want to hear this story. I was going to let you finish, but I want to hear about the story. You sitting with Vitalik and a bunch of other early adopters. Because I was going to ask, first off, follow-up question. When yeah. was this? Because so, I'd imagine it was like... 2014. 20, yeah. Yeah, 2014, 2015. So now the timeline's been set. So I'd love to hear the story of yeah, you Yeah, so the first time I heard about Bitcoin... And who else was in this room? <laughs> like... <laughs> I would have loved to be there, but... To be I'll a fly in the wall. Oh, goodness. Yeah, I was first introduced <laughs> to the idea of Bitcoin back in 2012. And then in 2014 is when I started to fall more so into the, the rabbit hole. And there was a meetup. Remember the platform meetup.com? I think it's still useful today, but it was much more popular back, back then. And there would be events listings and you could do a hiking group, a book club, etc. club. And I was Googling Bitcoin and crypto. Mm -hmm. This is at the time where I had a Google News alert set up so that anytime the word Bitcoin appeared anywhere on the internet, I was getting an email notification of it mm -hmm. because it was so rare. And I was like, oh, I wonder who else is doing anything in this, so in this area. Just to take it a step back, when was the first like time you heard about 
How did you come across just Bitcoin or cryptocurrency? So I came across it through the friend who called me to say, hey, are you paying attention okay. to this crypto thing yeah. because of all my travels yeah, and my right. Ziploc bags of currency? I was like, OK, this is this is interesting. And then when I came around to it again, circa 2014, it's because I had all that CA experience and all of the mm -hmm. auditing and the thinking about the ledgers that it occurred to me, wait a second, this blockchain thing is really a set of distributed ledgers. This could create triple entry accounting. Double entry accounting was a really big deal when it was introduced. Like massive transformative deal. I'm not going to lie. I don't know what. That, 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 that's okay. But the whole <laughs> financial system that exists yeah. today mm -hmm. and the way that accounting and financial reporting exists mm -hmm. today is from double entry accounting. Mm -hmm. it's Just been, Google it if you don't know. Exactly. Just do your it, research. <laughs> <laughs> All you need to know, the introduction of that was a big deal. Yeah. And so in my head, like, well, if we go from double entry to triple entry accounting, that's also going to be a really big deal, probably worth paying attention to. Mm -hmm. So I would read anything and everything I could find my hands on online. And I found this meetup. And it was in Vancouver where I was living at the time. And I show up after work. And you have to picture me. I'm coming from work. So mm -hmm. I'm wearing a pencil skirt, a peplum blazer. I'm in heels. I'm carrying a little purse. And I'm walking down the street that gets progressively more and more sketchy the further down it you go from downtown. I'm like, okay, where is it that I'm going? And I'm looking for this address and I don't see a building with this address marked. There's a small little hair salon mm -hmm. and then nothing. And so I pop in, I'm like, hi, is this the address? Like, no, maybe try next door. Sure, sure. Next door is an unmarked black metal door. No sign, no nothing. Okay, open this heavy door. Creek. Loud creak. Uh -huh. <laughs> and of course, there's a set of stairs going down. Hmm. Okay. So I go down the set of stairs that are slightly creaky. And as I'm doing this, I'm thinking, Ileana, what are you doing? Sounds like a start of a scary movie. <laughs> this is beginning to sound like the start of a scary movie. Not that I watch movies and definitely not scary movies. But you're an auditor. You should have every alarm bell in your body currently going off. And there's a cat at the bottom of the landing. Of course, there there is. And there's another door and I walk through the door and suddenly the conversation stops and it's a room full of men. Some of them look like they haven't showered in a couple of <laughs> days and they all stop what they're doing and they turn and you can hear the creak of their heads. And the unasked question in the room was, and who are you and what are you doing here? And in that moment, I really wished I had a little white flag to wave and say, hi, <laughs> my name is Ileana. I come in peace. I think that what you're all working on is really exciting. Can I be friends? I swear, I'm not here from any of the agencies to shut you down. I'm not from the FBI, the CIA, the oh, CRA, yeah. et cetera. <laughs> and honestly, it took a while for them to warm up to me and be like, okay, she comes in peace. She's here to help us. And I would sit there saying, okay, can you explain to me what it is that you're working on? And they'd explain, I'm like, mm -mm, we're going to try this again. And <laughs> I'd ask 10 different questions from 10 different angles until I'd finally, okay, so this is kind of what you're doing? And they're like, oh yeah, I guess that's another way to describe it. I'm like, great. I'm going to take this info and go relay it to some of the people that I know that work in banking and in finance and in all the other places, literally above ground, mm -hmm. and maybe explain <laughs> to them that there's this cool new tech invention and evolution coming coming out I'm like oh okay cool and you know vitalik is on the screen he was in toronto at the time zooming in or google hangouts or whatever platform we were using and yeah those were the those are the early days of building <laughs> that's such a good story especially i would like you just walking in and them turning around like you with like all dressed up with uh -huh. your purse uh -huh. i would have loved to see <laughs> reaction <laughs> just their faces like and what they were thinking <laughs> just seeing you stand there but that is an amazing story so mm -hmm. you really got not even early adopter like you were with the pioneers of the space mm -hmm. you got to learn firsthand from them mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. amazing so after that sketchy <laughs> night down in the basement <laughs> with some of the biggest names in the space you went and you took the technology and at the time, you were still at Deloitte, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you co-founded Rubix. That's right. And Rubix is the first blockchain that was... So it was the first blockchain consulting business consulting. that existed at any of the large firms anywhere in the world, even outside of the, the big four. Yeah. And I remember getting a phone call once on my cell 
from the then chief financial officer at Toyota Financial Services. And I was like, A, how did you get my phone number? He's like, oh, I've been online stalking you for the better part of the past year. And he's like, you seem to be the only person that knows anything about this topic at any of these big firms. Can you fly to LA to meet with me and my executive team and help us understand what this technology is going to mean for the future of our business? I said, oh, okay. Sure. And so I went and did that. And that was... check my account. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> I'll let you know. And so I went down and that was part of a number of other conversations I was having with some really senior executives mm-hmm. in different industries. And I remember having meetings with banks and the bank execs would take the meeting under one condition. Can you guess what it was? Secrecy. Oh, I was going to say exclusivity, but... Secrecy. Not one of the banks wanted to be featured in the front page of the Globe and Mail as so-and-so bank is talking or exploring crypto. It was a foreign forbidden word. And most of the people I met with were from the risk departments trying to wrap their head around what this this meant. And there was one point where I was living in Vancouver and I was waking up at 4 or 4.30 in the morning because I'd get on phone calls starting at 4.30 or 5 a.m. with some senior exec that was living in Europe at a bank, and that was the only time that worked for them. So obviously I had to adjust my calendar mm-hmm. to to suit. But the, the conversations when you're introducing a new technology are always fraught with lots and lots and lots of questions and lots of skepticism, and you learn you learn a lot. People are not really welcoming to change. People hate change. Especially in these like age old industries where things have been working really well for a long time. Correct. These big players, they don't want, they don't have incentive to. It's not just the big companies though. Humans in general don't love change. It takes a lot of mental processing and cognitive power. And if it ain't broken, don't fix it is the prevailing sentiment. Now my role, while I'm really well known for the blockchain space, it's a tiny portion of my overall portfolio of where I spend my mm-hmm. my time. I spend my time on overall innovation and overall tech trends. And it doesn't matter what topic I'm talking about. As a story, I was presenting to a number of senior government executives in Canada. And I got off stage and this woman comes up to me and says, thank you. That was the most thought-provoking presentation that we've ever had. I was like, oh, great. Thank you so much for the feedback. Her next statement surprised me. And she said, I have never been more grateful that I retire in the next two years. So I don't have to deal with this. Okay. So my next thought was, I wonder who her successor is. And if I can get them on the phone or meet with them. I realized that's government. By the time you figure out who the next successor is, there's an election and you really can't predict. Uh, (laughs) So it doesn't matter what topic or domain you're in. People generally don't like change. But like I feel like when it comes to especially with like government and stuff, and like you need to be able to pivot because a lot of Fortune five hundred companies, I forget the exact stat, but they all fail and it's because not they all fail, a large number No, I mean they're still many of them are still around. Many of them are still around, but the <laughs> statistic is like since like nineteen uh twenty, only like eleven percent of the Fortune 500 companies are still around. And it, so many of the big ones fail throughout because they fail to adjust and They change. fail to innovate. They, Absolutely. Yeah. So like that's a... That, I remember I was at a talk and the speaker said that and I was like, there's no way that's true. He's just making that shit up. Mm-hmm. And I Googled it and it was true. And I was like, mm-hmm. interesting. And mm-hmm. the reason is what you said, where new technologies emerge and they just don't pivot fast enough as well as just not at all. The natural human reaction is to bury your head in the sand and say, la, 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 la. (laughs) It'll pass. This is not happening. (laughs) This will pass. Somebody else is going to deal with it. And that's why there's so much inertia when it comes to innovation and getting things done, especially in large organizations. Mm. So within your role as an innovation lead and executive, Mm -hmm. what's your day in the life of like dealing with this? Because you probably have to stay ahead of the game especially as such a large organization like Accenture. Mm -hmm. Accenture is one of the biggest technology companies in the world. Mm -hmm. So when you're dealing at that scale, like what, what do you use? Like what methods do you use to convince people or like just when you're dealing with them that, Hey, like we need to move and we need to move fast and we can't be stagnating. Mm -hmm. So 
how are these conversations you're having and like how do you go about it absolutely so the good news is that Accenture as a business really believes in innovation mm. in fact we invest to the tune of a billion dollars b with a b per year in innovation and that includes our research and development and the patents that we have issued inside of our labs the various assets and prototypes that we end up building so that when a client comes to us we've already been ahead of that space for a couple of, of years. So we tend mm -hmm. to invest significantly beyond the curve. As an example now, on the generative AI topic, we just announced a $3 billion investment in our data and AI business just last mm -hmm. week. And we also announced a partnership with Microsoft to build a dedicated global generative AI lab here in Toronto. Oh, the really? Global Lab is going to be here in Toronto. And this is part of us staying ahead of the curve. And over the past 10 years, we've already had over 1,400 patents and patents pending on the fields of data, AI, and gen AI. So we've been at this for a very long time. So at least that sets the table where at Accenture, I always know that we have people working on the latest and greatest cutting edge of everything. Mm -hmm. And then it's a matter of turning around and figuring out, what of this portfolio and of the trends of what's happening in the world is relevant to this Fortune 500 client of ours and the priorities that this organization has set out to their investors around their future strategy, where their growth domains are, target audiences they're getting in front of, and, and so on and so forth. So the first part of my role is straightforward, fairly straightforward, because of the investments that we make in innovation. The second part of my role is essentially convincing. Mm. Educate convince that there's a business case that they need to do this and then it's to hold people's hands and say it's going to be okay we've got your back we'll help you through this every single step of the way you're going to be okay by the end of it and that's the arc of innovation mm. so the people that i tend to hire aren't just really creative outside the box thinkers they are people with exceptional communication skills and really high empathy because we could pitch ideas all day, every day. We could throw spaghetti against the wall. But if you can't put yourself in the shoes of the client exec stakeholder that's sitting across the table from you and understand what's in it for them, what's in it for their business, what drives them, what gets them up at night, you're not going to be successful in getting them on board to whatever the new thing is that you're trying to get them excited about. It's a very human Consulting and innovation consulting is a very human business. Yeah, I feel like that's a very underrated skill set. The empathy very. and being able to communicate. Everyone likes to think they're a really good communicator mm -hmm. until they have to communicate <laughs> something, which is like to someone that doesn't get it. And uh -huh. it's like, oh, okay, like you really have to walk them through. And having the empathy mm -hmm. is where really that's a game changer. When you hire people, what do you look for more? Is it the ladder of like the communication or an empathy or technical? It's both and it depends on the role. So as part of our innovation teams at Accenture, we have various specialties. Mm -hmm. We have one group that is predominantly full of designers and design thinking talent. They are world-class facilitators, storytellers, creative problem solvers. I call them my Swiss army knife. Mm -hmm. If I could throw them at <laughs> any problem That's and they will one. be able to, to figure it out. Yeah. We have teams that do industry innovation. So what's the latest happening in insurance? What's the latest happening in healthcare? What's the latest happening in insert your favorite industry of, of choice? Yeah. And they monitor all of the trends. They have a really good finger on the pulse of what's happening in, in, in market. They're monitoring the earnings reports from various companies in, in that domain. Then we have a team that's called Ventures. And that's a global group that invests in startups. So in a way, Accenture is leaning into being a VC firm. And we have the flip side of the ventures team that's called Open Innovation. And we look at startups, either the ones that we've invested in or others that we haven't put any equity stake into, and we connect these companies to the big Fortune 500 organizations mm -hmm. to make life better for the startup so that they don't spend the next two years in a long sales cycle with the elephant that happens to be the enterprise and the small mouse that happens to be the startup potentially getting squashed yeah. in the process. <laughs> Which usually happens. That's usually what, what happens without you know the hand-holding and intervention. 
uh, and then it's a benefit for the corporate client because we've done a lot of the market scanning, we've done the due diligence, mm -hmm. we know where else this company has been successful and we can accelerate our clients' priorities. So the ventures team is a separate team. We have a group that does rapid prototyping and going from a concept to a wireframe or a clickable prototype or a fully functioning mm -hmm. uh, product in a very short period of time. We have a team globally, our labs team, and that's where a lot of the patents tend to come out of. And so we have a big focus now in areas like material science or space that yeah. happens to be um, a domain of, of ours. So depending on what type of team you're hiring for, it's a different set of skills and what you're indexing. But across the board, whether it's a really strategic communications heavy role or a very, very technical hands-on role, you still need curiosity yeah. and you still need some level of empathy and communication skills because we operate as teams within the firm and we operate as teams when we're servicing clients as well. So do you oversee everything you just mentioned or is it just... Yeah, so I oversee all of those components that we have in our Canadian market and make sure that they're all operating as one seamless team to service the local Canadian clients and then also connecting with our global groups to always be keeping abreast of is there anything new and exciting coming down the pipeline that we're not aware of quite quite yet. That is amazing. Yeah. So how is it you stay so productive? Like what's your secret like what is it what are your tools you use what's your tell me more about the inside of your days it's probably like a lot but how do you manage everything it's a lot of context switching and i would be lying if i said i had figured it all out mm -hmm. i don't i'm still thinking through what are my personal systems and processes in in place but so far the key has been building out really strong teams and mm. you start with one team, you build it, you get it to a certain state of run, and then you can shift gears and build the next team and the next team and the next team. And at a certain point in time, you can delegate authority and say, you've got it. Let me know where you need help or where I can be an escalation point as opposed to being really deeply in, in the weeds. I don't have a typical day in the life. Maybe I'll walk you through a week yeah. in the life. Yeah. Okay. So on Mondays, I tend to have a lot of meetings with my direct reports and the people that run the various sub teams, as well as some of my industry innovation leaders, just mm -hmm. making sure we're all on the same page, understanding what's happening in their personal lives. How was their weekend? Is their dog sick? Is their cat sick? Is their child sick? Is mm -hmm. their spouse okay? You know, just connecting with them on a truly, human. truly human basis. And we've had really amazing people on the on the teams and great retention as well. So I'm very I'm very proud of the the people yeah. side of the the equation. That's always a good sign. <laughs> I think so. Especially the pandemic, we got very close very quickly, and there was a lot of pivoting re yeah. required. And then Tuesdays, I tend to spend with our industry teams going through file by file by file by file. So I might start my 9 a.m going through insurance. And I have our head of insurance that will talk through, here are the four or five projects happening with these four or five clients of ours. And at the table, we have representation from our ventures group, from this design heavy group, from our technology and prototyping groups, so they can hear firsthand what matters to XYZ insurance company and what's the problem that we're trying to solve for. We'll collectively do some brainstorming and then now the insurance lead can go off and have follow-up meetings with various subject matter experts that have been suggested and to go look at that case study and that case study, even if maybe it draws from a different industry altogether. There's a lot of cross-industry plays. And then fast forward to Tuesday afternoon, and I might be having that same type of meeting with our natural resources lead. We do a lot of work with utilities and um, other natural resources companies, and that same conversation. My in-betweens are peppered in with meeting the new interns or the new analysts or a new hire to Accenture, taking them out for, for lunch or taking a client meeting where I have to present to them on some topic that they're particularly interested in. And then in the afternoon, I might meet with a startup that's part of our venture portfolio to get a better sense of who they are, what they do, who they need to be introduced to, and then think through who's in my Rolodex, who's in my extended network Rolodex that I can put them in touch yeah. with. And then I go to an event 
or two per per week, whether it's a, a tech meetup or a conference or a gala. And then maybe once a week, I have something related to, I sit on a few boards of directors. And so I'll have some board committee meeting or a full board meeting or the reading of the materials for, yeah. for that. And then some time to catch up on industry news, reports that teams have put out, HR things, yeah. you know. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big week. <laughs> it's a lot going on. So how do you, what's your outlet? How do you unwind from work? What's your thing that just lets you feel re-energized? I do nothing. Nothing? And it's wonderful. People have a tendency of assuming that I'm a giant extrovert. I'm actually an introvert. Really? And so at the end of a long day or at the end of a long week, you can see me coming into my home, closing all of the blinds, turning off all of the lights, and just sitting. Visualize me plugged into a wall as though I was an appliance, <laughs> recharging. That's me, except I'm not physically plugged into a wall. Yeah. So that's how I recharge. I mean, I have hobbies and things that I'm excited to go do, mm -hmm. but that's my primary wind down reset mechanism. So it's not like meditating or something. You just, just sit there and you just, well, I mean, I meditate I guess while I, when I, it, it is state. a meditative, <laughs> it is a meditative state. I'm not sleeping. Mm -hmm. It's I'm resting. I'm doing an active rest. And sometimes yeah. I'm on the couch. Sometimes I'm on my yoga mat. Um, I tend to start most of my days with a dance party mm -hmm. by myself, turn on some music, <laughs> do my Pilates, <laughs> dance. Yeah. If I can do that and have a morning smoothie, I know that I've just set my day up for for success. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like the sitting and just doing nothing is like an underrated thing because these days we're always doing something. We're uh -huh. never like bored or just like sitting there unwinding. It's just like, oh, I'm in the elevator. Let me pull out my phone and scroll even though I don't have service. <laughs> oh, I'm doing this. I'm Every time it's just going from one thing to another. And that's something I've, like, I've been trying to implement more of i feel like it it does work just like sitting there mm -hmm. doing nothing even though like there's a gnawing of like oh i should check my email uh, i go on my laptop but mm -hmm. so i'm gonna adopt more of that mm -hmm. and yeah it's interesting to hear that that's how we're human we're human beings not mm -hmm. human doings and that is something i've had to rewire my brain over the past few years to get out of the mindset of you always have to be on, you always have to be producing in order to feel like a valuable human. Like you're yeah. a valuable human just for existing. I like that. That's a good one. <laughs> human beings, not human doing. Yeah. I have that problem. I mm -hmm. feel like I always got to, once I finish something, I'm like, all right, what's next? Mm -hmm. I can't just, so I'm trying to switch it up and, you know, be a little more grounded, take some time. Mm -hmm. We kind of skipped a step. I feel like we, we want talked about Deloitte and then we talked about Accenture. So, how did you transition from Deloitte bringing blockchain? Mm -hmm. I want to hear a little bit more about when you brought Rubix, which is the first blockchain consulting in mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. How did people receive it? Because you went from talking to these three, four random guys in the basement to going and telling your higher ups, I mean, guys, I have this new changing technology. We got to get on it. People were confused, confuzzled, and very concerned for me. <laughs> They're like, uh, are you okay? Have you gone crazy? I actually had a very senior partner that I respect dearly mm -hmm. pull me aside into his office one day and say, Ileana, I'm really worried about the potential damage you may be doing to your professional reputation. Wow. Oh, okay. Mind you, this is a senior global partner that was responsible and mostly spending a lot of his time across North and South America, was always on airplanes. I didn't realize that he was keeping that close tabs on me. I mean, I felt flattered that <laughs> he took the time out of his busy day to notice and to be concerned and to actually tell me yeah. that he was concerned. He's like, you're spending a lot of time on this topic of bit coin and there you know with the allegations of money laundering and unsavory characters and you're a ca and i just really want you to make sure that you know what it is that you're that you're doing because i don't want you to ruin your reputation i'm like oh i mean it's really thoughtful guidance and i remember a couple of years later a different partner who had also expressed deep concern about all of this called me and said so i have a client that just called me 
asking if I knew you and if I could introduce them to you directly, mm. would you take this phone call? And I was like, yes, <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'll take the, the phone call. But I could just visualize this partner's face on the other side of the phone where he's like, I can't believe that this is the conversation that I'm having right right now. I mean, yeah, like we said earlier, disruption doesn't, the people don't receive it well. It, it's hard, but I was, I've been fortunate in that I've been able to find a handful of the change agents in the organizations that you can convince. Mm. Not everyone is convincible, nor should you spend time trying to convince everyone. It's a bit of a fool's errand. But if you find a couple of people where their eyes sparkle and you can see the gears turning in their head as they're like, oof, this is complicated, this is hard, but it's probably worth leaning into, Mm -hmm. you need to follow follow through. And when I was at, at Deloitte, we had had a CEO Dragon's Den type challenge. And so I was part of a small team that put in um, this idea to say, hey, like we've been tinkering around with all this blockchain stuff. This is what we want to do. This is how we want to build it. And then we ended up winning seed money through the CEO to to get started. And we had mentors on that external panel like John Ruffalo and mm-hmm. Valerie Fox and a couple of others that helped to sway the decision to be like, yes, you should invest in this bleeding edge thing. Were you working on that project for the duration of your time at Deloitte since you introduced it? Yeah, so it started as a side hobby and Mm. evenings and weekends. And I knew that I had a quote unquote problem when I found myself at two o'clock in the morning on the depths of the internet in some forum talking about blockchain stuff and reading (laughs) and realizing, Eliana, what on earth are you doing? You have a client meeting at 8.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning and you have to be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and ready to to go. Mm -hmm. Why are you still awake right now? Go to sleep. I was just so excited. Um, And at one point I had told my Vancouver-based team and bosses that I needed to go to Toronto. Look, I think all the clients are there. I think all the decision makers are there. All the people who can write the investment checks Mm -hmm. are in Toronto. It doesn't make sense for me to be in Vancouver. Let me go there for two months, maybe three months, and just give this a proper kick at the can and see what we can do and what we can make happen. Two months turn to three, three turn to four, four turn to five, (laughs) five turn to six. I get a phone call from my boss in Vancouver saying, so are you ever coming back home? Like, is this... Did you just move to Toronto? Is this what's happening? (laughs) It's like, well, I don't know, but I feel like I'm onto something. And he says, listen, I have a job offer for you that you can't refuse. I'm like, oh, do do tell. And he says, I want you to be my chief of staff as I undertake a tour through all of South America and to take an inventory of our businesses throughout South America and use this to figure out our next long-term strategy. He knew that I love traveling because of my background. I speak Spanish. And he said, this is going to check all of the boxes of someone who's very easily excitable and you like variety in in your work. (laughs) Come join me. I think you'd be the perfect um, right hand. And it was a hard, hard, hard set of decisions because I had to seriously mull it over and I really wanted the role. I really wanted the chief of staff role. And eventually I told him, you know, I have to think about this. I'll, I'll come back to you. And he's like, okay, but don't take too long. And when I eventually called him back and said, listen, I don't think I could take this role. He was like, what do you mean? Why? And my response was, if you had given me this offer a year ago or two years ago, I would have taken it without blinking. But now I think I'm onto something and I don't know if this is going to work. It may completely fall flat on its face, but I think I owe myself a shot and I'm really excited about this new thing, this new blockchain and emerging tech thing. And worst case scenario, if this whole thing falls apart and I fall on my face, I'm still a chartered accountant. I still have my professional experience to fall on. I'm a pretty friendly, approachable human for the most part. And I have a really broad, wide network across different industries and fields. I think I'm going to be okay. I think I'll always be able to find myself my next my next role or my next opportunity. And you could hear him on the other side of the phone sigh and be like, oh, not the answer I thought I was going to, <laughs> to get. And yeah, that's when I realized, I guess I kind of accidentally moved to Toronto. Whoops. <laughs> so that's how you came here. Now Accident- got that I, came, I came here with one suitcase. <laughs> yeah, just one, one, one turn to two. <laughs> one suitcase 
because I had a full life in Vancouver. Mm. I used to run a scotch club that I founded there. I had this amazing group of friends. I was out hiking every weekend. I was living this wonderful, wonderful existence. Being in Toronto was not on the cards. <laughs> so I have a question for you then. Yeah. Since you've been in Vancouver and now you're in Toronto, which one do you prefer, Toronto or Vancouver? It's actually neither and all at the same time. What I'm realizing is, for me, there isn't just one city that meets all of my needs and that I want to live in 365 days of the year, 24 seven. Mm. It's too tall a stretch. My ideal is actually to have two or three home bases around the world that then I can go and explore from because each of those home bases brings something different and unique to the table. Yeah. So I no longer I no longer allow myself to think of this as a binary this city or this city sort of decision. That's a great answer. So to follow up, mm -hmm. what would be your home bases? <laughs> At this point in your life. So it's still a bit of a work in progress, but if I had my magic wand, mm -hmm. I would love to retain a Canadian home base or two, you know, between Toronto and, and Vancouver. I'd love to have more of a formal pied-a-terre in the, in the U.S. Probably in the U.S., Miami makes the most sense. I yeah. mean, it seems half of New York has moved there. Half of California has moved there. The mayor has rolled out the red carpet to say, if you work in tech and you're doing anything innovation <laughs> related, please come to Miami. Their advertising campaigns are spot on. It's sunny all year round, no state taxes. And Miami itself is actually very progressive as a city on a number of, of fronts. So that covers the North American base mm -hmm. having a pied de terre in the caribbean would be interesting maybe some more like a barbados uh, yeah. once again their prime minister mia is very forthcoming to innovation and the the latest and greatest but i'd love to spend more time in the middle east so i've spent some time in dubai would gladly have a bit of a base there there's just so much happening in the emerging growth markets mm -hmm. that people who live in north america tend to take a very north american centric view of the of the world but that's factually in, inaccurate. Yeah. So being able to have more of a home base, let's say in the Middle East or somewhere in, in Asia, TBD where would be awesome. And then maybe something in, in Europe. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah, that pretty much covers all the pieces. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love the idea of Australia, but it's frankly too far. And if you're spending time somewhere like Miami, that acts as your gateway into into South America. I don't mm. necessarily need a Miami and a Caribbean home base. One would be sufficient mm. to at least cover off South America, covering off all the big time zones. Yeah. And well, then from <laughs> those pied de you can go off and explore the, the rest of the world. But I really liked what you said about like us in North America. We always think of the world and like mm -hmm. North America is a center and we follow certain trends, whatever happening here. Because yesterday at Collision, I mm -hmm. actually ran across Yatsu, who owns Animoca Brands. Mm -hmm. I was just talking to him about crypto, the blockchain industry, so on and so forth. And I was like, what are your thoughts on like, you know, there's like a crypto winter and the SEC is filing um, 68 cryptocurrencies as mm -hmm. securities. Mm -hmm. I was just getting his thoughts. And he's like, so I was like, do you think is this like the markets are going to recover from this? He's like, the markets are fine. If you go anywhere but here, like everywhere is fine. In Dubai, it's flourishing. In Asia, people use it all the time. The Web3 industry is literally thriving. Mm -hmm. So he's like, you guys just have this like thought and like eco chamber in North America where like you are almost like programmed to think crypto is dying and it's not recovering. He's like, if you go anywhere else, like where he's based, which is Hong Kong and Asia, mm -hmm. um, it's killing it. And he goes to Dubai and same thing. So it's just interesting how like here we kind of have like mm -hmm. our little eco chamber. So traveling mm -hmm. outside always makes mm -hmm. sense. What are your thoughts on what's happening with the cryptocurrency, with the SEC, filing them as securities and all <laughs> that? So I won't comment on the SEC specifically, mm -hmm. but what I will comment on is that regulators have a responsibility to ensure that the public and consumers are protected. Absolutely. But on the flip side of that responsibility, regulators have a responsibility to understand the technology that they are trying to regulate and re legislate. And I don't often think that both of these things are happening concurrently. And this is not just in the, in the U.S. I remember 
years ago, getting a chance to present to the Canadian Federation of Regulators. Mm -hmm. And it was 28 federal agencies, everything from Canada Border Services to Canadian Food Inspection Agency and everything in, in between. And I never thought that a conversation with regulators could be this engaging. But it was. Every single one of them was sitting on the very edge of their seats, paying very, very close attention and asking really thoughtful questions around, hey, we don't get this, we don't get this, help us help us to understand. And I think that you need a lot of that regulatory openness to engage in dialogue to end up on the other side with rules and policies that make sense and that can protect the general public and the, and the interests. And right now, what I will say, the general market sentiment mm -hmm. is that in the U.S., that neither of those pieces are really are really happening yeah. the way that they they should be and it's challenging because you want to see countries tapping into the growth potential of new and emerging tech and geopolitics changes which countries are dominant in which domains mm -hmm. changes just because one region was a dominant power historically does not always mean that it's going to continue to be a dominant power into the into the future yeah. and I don't know if people think through that enough yeah no it's interesting because with like technologies that are emerging it's hard to regulate something you don't understand, understand yeah and so often these government agencies whether it's here in the states mm -hmm. or elsewhere mm -hmm. they don't understand they're bringing mm -hmm. in the people that are at the forefront to like hey can you come in and explain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then they're trying to regulate based off that when yeah. That's not how things are supposed to be. It's the same thing that's happening in a with AI, mm -hmm. where they're trying to regulate it, but what, as they're trying to come up with the regulations, the technology moves so far ahead that like mm -hmm. you're so far behind a month uh -huh. or two ago. Uh -huh. Like whatever you're drawing up in terms of regulations may or may not apply. The tech changes. First principles don't change, and so I think going back to first principles is really important for mm -hmm. for regulators. The other piece is having a diverse set of people at the table that are making the decisions to begin with. Mm -hmm. And one area I will call out is age diversity. It can be really challenging to explain to a regulator that's in their 70s about the latest and greatest tech when they're not even surgically attached to their cell phone. <laughs> they're like, wait, what? So how does this thing they work? They pull out if a flip phone. They're like, what, <laughs> so how does this work and where is this data stored? And you're like, well, it's stored in the cloud and that's one of the core premises of X, Y, and Z. What's they're the like, cloud? but what's the cloud and how does it work and how do I audit it and how do I touch it and how do I feel it? And you're like, just got to let out a long sigh. <laughs> a long sigh, prepare, compose yourself and then start again from the, the basics. But whether it's regulators, whether it's boards of directors, that's another really big area of focus for, for me. So at the end of the day, the board of directors is the group that controls the compensation and the decisions as to whether a CEO of a business mm -hmm. is doing his or her job effectively. Yep. And boards have a fiduciary responsibility to the organization that they shepherd to make sure that this business continues to survive well into the, the future. And usually by the time somebody gets to be on a board, they tend to be quite senior in their career and therefore they also tend to be quite a bit older. Yep. And so there's this constant grapple of, well, they have a responsibility to keep abreast of what's happening, but they may or may not be the ones closest to feeling the finger on the pulse of what's going on in the, in the markets. So mm -hmm. I oftentimes get brought in to be the younger expert person in the, in the room to say, Hey, this is how the world is changing. This is what this might mean to your business. This is what this might mean to your industry. This is how you might want to, to adapt and think about this. So whether we're talking to boards of directors or we're talking to regulators, anyone who is making long-term decisions about anything of significance needs to ensure that they have the right people at the table that can speak to the nuances and that understand the subject matter that they're discussing. Yeah, I agree. It's just those these people that are in these positions, when they get them, it's very hard for to like get them to leave so that the new batch can it's come in. It's not that they're it's not that you're trying to get people to leave. It's just the very nature of the world and they've amassed a lot of expertise and they're in those roles for a reason mm -hmm. it's just how do you constantly stay refreshed because the world and the pace of change it's never going to slow down yeah but at a certain <laughs> point it's like it's almost like too late like if you're in your 70s and 80s and now 
where we have to explain what the cloud is to you mm-hmm. in order to explain what the next technological change like you that might be time for you know a new person agreed, to come agreed, and stuff agreed up, or so. to have that balanced perspective so if you have a slate of board members a slate of decision makers at the table of 12 people make sure that you have representation from at least each of the generations and from the various topic areas mm-hmm. instituting term limits I think is actually a very good idea in most um, in most cases as as well. You need the wisdom of somebody who's been around for a long time yeah, because they just sure. have a different view of the world and society and how things have progressed and they'll be able to identify. And this really may be a fad because we experienced this three decades ago in this other context. I mm-hmm. do not want to poo-poo that that wisdom that they, they have. And I think it's super valuable. Mm-hmm. It just needs to be augmented with people who are at the table who yeah. have a different opinion. Yeah, I agree. That's a, the, the diversity aspect of having everyone mm-hmm. there with different subject matters. Mm-hmm. That's what's key. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're getting to the last little part of our show. Uh, how are we on time? Just over an hour. Just oh, wow. Time hour. flies. Yeah, it does fly. <laughs> uh, I think we'll do our rapid fire round. <laughs> rapid fire round. Just rapid asking fire. questions. Very quick answers. So first question is, who's a person you trade places with for a day? Who would I trade places with for a day? Just because they're rapid fire doesn't mean they're easy questions. I would really be interested in understanding how someone like a Barack Obama would have managed his days when he was in office. Mm. Because you think about context switching and you think about big picture decisions and needing to be educated and the rest. How does an effective politician of any sorts at any scale representing any large country do it? Okay. That would so it's more of a role. That would be more a of a role. Than a person. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 yeah. that works. What is your guilty pleasure? <laughs> I've really gotten into acrylic painting, like abstract art painting, and I don't get a chance to do it very often. But when I do, it's awesome because you can't do anything else while you're painting. You can't touch your phone because your hands (laughs) up to your elbows are essentially covered in paint. I'm not a very good painter, so that's why I am very, very messy. And you can completely tune out the world and use a different part of the brain, and you can almost feel the cobwebs coming Mm. off like ooh, we haven't been utilized yet this is great (laughs) (laughs) so i think that would be that would be one what's the best compliment you've ever gotten (laughs) i've gotten variations of this but when people say you're not what i thought you were i was Mm. like oh or you're not what you appeared to to be meaning that I have different edges and different sides to my personality that doesn't necessarily come across if you just read my bio or you just see my very corporate headshot. And I'm like, yeah, I like being a warm human and also being an exec and also and, 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 and. What's the worst piece of advice you've ever received? Oh, gosh, so much of this. Um, Other than not looking into blockchain. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going through the Rolodex of. Mm. It's not necessarily just one piece of advice, but there have been many a time in my career and my life where I've just been told, well, like, no, you, you shouldn't even bother trying to do that because why, why would you, you can't do that. I'm like, well, why can't I do that? Whatever I decide to put my mind to. And they're like, well, people who look like you don't really do things like that. And you're like, oh, Okay. Cool, 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 cool. So if anyone tells you you can't do something and you really want to, just go do it anyways. Yeah, prove them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> prove them Prove them wrong, yeah. What's something you wish you were better at? Being more succinct. Mm. One of my team members asked, he's like, Ileana, or I think it was a she, do you want to be a TED talker or a tick talker? <laughs> I'm like, oh, TED talker, please. <laughs> That's a good one. I might ask. That should be a rapid fire question. <laughs> Do you want to be a TED talker or a TikToker? I don't know if I can convey enough nuance 
in 30 seconds. Mm. And I also can't dance and talk at the same time. <laughs> Maybe that's something you could add to my list of things I was better at in a different life. TikTok is, it's growing. It's, it's, it it's is. changing. Oh, it is. <laughs> changing the way things are. Mm -hmm. But what never fails to make you laugh? Cats. 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 There's this one hilarious music video um, or a video set to the song Sale by, I think it's Abel Nation, and it's a cat that's sitting and perching on a windowsill. And then when the song says Sale, the cat jumps and does this, <laughs> and just flies, and it's absolutely priceless. The cat videos <laughs> online. Do you have any pets? <laughs> No, I, I tend to travel and bounce around a lot. I used to foster, and now I just dog sit and cat sit for anyone who's like, oh, I'm going to be away for a week. And I'm like, great. <laughs> I get to take your pet, and then I get to give it back to you. That's Fantastic. probably the best deal. It's the just, best arrangement. It's like no responsibility or just a little bit uh -huh. responsibility. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Exactly. I think we'll, we'll cut it. How's, how are you on time? I had a decently flexible afternoon today. Other than I may be buying a distressed real estate property. Oh, There's that going sounds to be like fun. More of those coming onto the market with the interest rates the way that they are, and interest rates are projected to go up again next um, next week. So, oh, yeah. Unfortunately, there are people who are finding themselves with mortgages that they just can't. Keep yeah, well, up. a lot of people bought during the low interest mm -hmm. rates on a variable interest rate mm -hmm. during COVID. It's a very different story to go from a 3% interest rate to, to a 6 or 7% interest rate. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good opportunity. Actually, that leads into the topic that I was going to mm -hmm. mention, which is Toronto's tech scene. So you came to Toronto by accident. And since you've been here, what are your thoughts on the tech scene emerging here? It's better than it used to be in that we have a tech scene. <laughs> and it's pretty, it's pretty vibrant yeah. and it's connected. What I would say, though, is we're still fairly insular. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I go down to the U.S. or I travel elsewhere and you meet founders who are thinking really boldly and so ambitiously. And the VCs are ambitious. And the corporate clients that sometimes support the startups tend to be a lot more open-minded. And you come back to Canada and you're like, oh, right, it's just a little bit smaller here and everything is at a see that's the thing scale. that i've noticed that as well where like even when companies i'm from waterloo mm -hmm. waterloo is a big yep, tech big hub big hub and whenever a company is on the verge of becoming a unicorn becomes a unicorn they just leave and go down to the states because they're like okay this is we're with the big boys now mm -hmm. is what i've heard mm -hmm. a founder literally say mm -hmm. so how do we make it so that this is the place people want to be where it's not just like a smaller thing where deals are always smaller and then companies aren't thinking that ambitious. And if they are and they get there, they're just like, okay, let me go play with the big boys. What do we got to do in Toronto to make it the place you want to come to? Mm -hmm. A lot of it is cultural, which I don't know if you can change mm. quickly, quickly enough. The other piece ends up being the practicalities of things like taxation. A couple of months ago, I had a chance to present to the future associate deputy ministers of the government of Canada. So the next generation of leaders being groomed for the senior most bureaucratic posts. And I had carte blanche to talk about anything. And one of the topics I wanted to bring up was a statistic from the passport index. The passport index ranks passports based on how valuable they are globally. Mm. Canada used to be ranked the passport number 14 in 2017. Pretty good. Yeah, pretty 2023, we dropped to 26. It's not that Canada became that much more worse in the past few years. It's that other countries have been trying so much more to attract talent, to attract startups, to attract innovators. In Canada, we can't say the, the same for. And I brought up the stat to them and I also posted on my Twitter and on my LinkedIn and just said, if you're a Canadian entrepreneur or just business person in general, and if you've recently left or you're considering leaving Canada and taxes are part of the, the situation, please ping me or reach out. I won't quote you. It'll be completely off the record. I would just love to get a sense of volume and to bring this up in conversations I have with government leaders. 
in like 36 hours, I had something like 50 pings. And these are people who have already shifted their tax bases elsewhere. They've moved. They said, nope, I'll keep the Canadian passport. Thank you, but I'm no longer going to be a tax resident. So I'm going to sever those ties. Or they're actively thinking about it. And that's not going to be a story that ends well for Canada if we're not able to really think through the systems level changes we need to make to support our competitiveness agenda. I agree. That is such a big thing in driving up economic prosperity these Mm -hmm. days, like innovation, especially in technology Mm -hmm. with AI, making everyone more efficient with Mm -hmm. these tools that are going to come up. Every tool that makes our life easier today was invented by an innovator. Mm -hmm. Innovators don't get enough credit and they are the backbone of society. And I think we need to treat them with that level of respect. There is a company out there called Nomad Capitalist And they have a mantra of go to where you are treated best around like if you're an entrepreneur or you're a business, don't assume that the country in which you're born or the country in which you're registered today is the country that you need to be in into perpetuity. And that message really resonates with me as as well, because people have never been more mobile than they are today. Mm -hmm. It's not difficult to incorporate a business in a different jurisdiction. Barbados announced that they are launching an embassy in the metaverse. So you could theoretically in the future register an online first global first business in one of these virtual type embassies and truly run a borderless business. And this is a topic that I'm thinking a lot about philosophically is borderlessness of humans. And in a way, going back to how we used to live many, many, many moons ago when we were more nomadic in nature in search of water, in search of food, in search of you know warm climates that are amenable to, to us, we're kind of going back to that again in a modern way with all of our creature comforts. Yeah, that is really interesting. Mm-hmm. That will change everything if you could just be able to go to embassies in the metaverse and then register... And work from anywhere in the mm-hmm. physical world. Yeah. Because it's kind of like that now for like with COVID accelerated it with it remote did. work where people and companies realize, oh, we can actually kind of operate without actually being in person, mm-hmm. whether that's efficient or moral or not. Like Elon Musk says, that's a different conversation. But the fact that it's able to happen. Mm-hmm. And I know a bunch of people that just travel the world mm-hmm. and one of my friends that's actually with me here, I call him a passport bro because he runs <laughs> his business. Passport bro. <laughs> yeah, because he just runs his business. He has a business which he runs all online, has multiple clients in every corner of the world. He works with companies that are based in Belgium, mm-hmm. companies that are based in Netherlands, mm-hmm. all these startups, mm-hmm. SaaS products. He's worked with um, DTC brands and he just runs his business working for them, helping them with mm-hmm. their sales funnels, so on and so forth. And he does it from his laptop. So this concept of, to relay back to what we were talking about, about Canada being competitive, in order to do that, where if a company that can be pretty much operate anywhere, you have to have incentive mm-hmm. because why would they choose you if there's other alternative? Yeah. But that also goes back to, it's really hard to compete with like a place like Dubai with 0% tax on income Mm -hmm. they added a corporate tax not a couple years ago that's just taxes Mm. countries aren't competing just on the basis of taxes very few people will make a determination of where to live just based on that it's weather it's general economy it's safety it's freedom of speech it's the ability to have community of like-minded people taxes are a portion of the of the consideration and it's part of the reason why i feel very strongly that increasingly in the future, more and more people are going to live as digital nomads. And I'm saying this in air quotes, Mm -hmm. because when people think digital nomad, close your eyes, what comes to mind? My friend, the past forever. (laughs) Just someone, honestly, someone Mm -hmm. in their lap with their laptop, just literally traveling the world. I think of like Bali in in Indonesia, Mm -hmm. going to Dubai the next day, going Costa Rica the next, Mm -hmm. just literally in flip flops, shorts, and a Hawaiian shirt with a laptop at their waist. Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> and most people, when they think digital nomad, they picture a 22-year-old sitting in a hammock in Bali, working on their computer <laughs> as a freelance graphics 
designer earning $15,000 a year. The stats show, though, that as of 2023, 36% of people who identified as digital nomads were earning at least $100,000 US dollars per year. Mm. And that's a very large increase from just 2020 when that number was under well under $75,000 US, which means either the nomads started to make more money or you have more people who are more senior, more established in their careers that are opting out of a lifestyle of living in just one place, deeply rooted, and towards exploring and being more more world travelers and looking for the places that treat them best mm. across a number of dimensions. Which they should. Which they should. <laughs> Correct. Do you ever see yourself being a digital nomad? Oh, yes. Yeah? Oh, yes, yes. I definitely identify as a, as a global citizen. A friend of mine not that long ago, remarked, she's like, Ileana, of course you identify that way. You've been a global citizen quite literally since you were born. Oh, right. Mick drop moment. Sometimes you just don't realize very obvious things about yourself until somebody else. Yeah, that's very true. Points <laughs> it out. I'm like, yeah, for me, my norm is to move and to shift environments. And I feel at home everywhere. Wherever mm. I am, it's home. Yeah. You can't outrun yourself, so. That is true. Well, traveling is one of the best things. Like, that's like my thing to do. Like, whenever I go to a new place and just you see that culture shift of mm -hmm. the way that people are living. And you're just like, all the problems that I was worried about back home and all these things, they just seem so mundane mm -hmm. and small. When like you see people just going about their lives in different, mm -hmm. different areas of the world. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, I think... That's a, that's where it's a good spot to wrap it up. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. This is fun. Um, thank you to Creator Club for hosting us. Mm -hmm. Thank you to Valentina. Yes. She's the star behind uh -huh. the camera. Um, yeah, this is the time when I let you say whatever you want. Whatever your <laughs> message is to the world, you could just convey it, say it. You could <laughs> opt out. We could just finish right here. So... <laughs> I would say change is scary. The world is changing quickly, but it doesn't have to be that scary. And if we use the social changes afoot, if we use the tech changes afoot and learn to harness them for our own maximum benefit as humans, I think that we could build a world that humans actually want to live in. Mm -hmm. So I tend to view myself as a pretty optimistic futurist. I think that there's a lot of doom and gloom yeah, out, out there, but I would definitely encourage people to be open-minded. Don't bury your head in the sand when you're confronted with a topic that's difficult or that challenges your assumptions. Lean into that discomfort because there's probably an element of growth that's that's to come. And my last comment would be don't sleep on this whole borderlessness trend it's one that i'm very excited to be digging into and thinking through all of the implications for the workforce for senior leaders and mm -hmm. boards of directors as well as for individuals and how that's going to change the world mic drop that's right <laughs> <laughs> all right perfect welcome that's to right. my brain <laughs>